Hello everyone and welcome to Mr. Simplifier's tutorials. In this tutorial, we're going to look at behavioral psychology and conditioning. Behaviorism is a concept based on the idea that all human behaviors are acquired through conditioning and that this conditioning happens through our repeated interactions with our environment. Behaviorism dictates that the study of human psychology should actually consist of studying observable human behavior and not unobservable events that, are, that are happen in the uh, human mind. Psyche, emotions, moods and other internal mental states are too subjective and cannot actually be used to prove anything. Behaviorists believe that any human being can actually be trained to perform any task regardless of where they come from and their internal thought process. It's all about the right environment and the right type of conditioning. Now, John B. Watson, considered to be the father of behaviorism, strongly believed that any child, irrespective of race, abilities or origins, can actually grow up to become anything like a doctor, lawyer, artist or even a thief with the right type of conditioning being offered to the right level. Now behaviorists believed that unlike other branches of psychology which pertain to internal psychological events which can be hypothetical, behaviorism is actually based on empirical evidence. Cause and effect can actually clearly be documented and it is therefore a lot more important to study behaviorism to actually study human or animal psychology. We are now going to look at some key concepts presented to us by some major contributors in this field, okay? Now the first concept is classical conditioning. This was proposed by Ivan Pavlov. Now do you think anyone would actually respond the same way to an advert of a cheeseburger as he would respond to an actual cheeseburger? Is that possible? Well, classical conditioning says yes. Classical conditioning directs towards a neutral stimulus generating the same response in us that a naturally occurring stimulus would. Now, Pavlov noticed that his dog started salivating before it was offered some delicious meat. Okay, so the dog's mouth started watering every time the meat was offered. He then started ringing a bell every time he offered meat to the dog. It gradually got to a point where the dog actually started salivating when it heard the bell, irrespective of the meat being present. Now this is what is called classical conditioning. The meat naturally resulted in salivation, so the meat is the unconditional stimulus, okay, and the salivation is the unconditional response. But the dog was, was conditioned to respond to the bell by using the meat. So this was something unnatural. So the bell is the conditional stimulus and the salivation was the conditional response because this is what we conditioned the dog to do. Okay? And the response doesn't need to be physical. It can also be emotional. For instance, if you go for an amazing drive and listen to a song uh, multiple times during the drive, listening to that song later could actually bring back memories of the drive to you. So classical conditioning is essentially a learning process which alters the way we respond to certain situations or alters our behavior. So next time you wonder why burgers and adverts can sometimes look so appetizing, remember that they want you to salivate, go out there and get that burger. Now the next concept is operant conditioning. This was proposed by B.F. Skinner. Now operant conditioning is based on how the type of feedback received from your environment alters your learning and your behavior in the environment. Essentially, your behavior will have consequences and these consequences will make you alter your behavior. And your behavior is therefore conditioned because of this, this feedback that you received 
and then there is a learning derived from this whole process okay uh, obviously if you get positive feedbacks from your initial behavior the feedback that you get uh, would would en ensure that you keep doing what you are doing and if it's a negative feedback that you received the feedback would be uh, encouraging enough for you to stop doing what you were doing okay now Skinner demonstrated this by designing what he called a Skinner's box so what he did was he essentially put rats and pigeons in boxes in his experiment the boxes would have levers with a food tray so what would happen is uh, once a, uh, once a rat accidentally discovers that pressing the lever presented food it would actually learn to do it repeatedly and get treats unless uh, until its hunger is satisfied but the box would also have electrical basis when activated it would deliver unpleasant shocks to the poor rats they would then through a process of discovery uh, through the process of learning realize that pressing the lever actually stops the shocks okay and in both cases they would actually press a lever sooner each time they were put in the box so one of in one of the occasions pressing a lever would present food and in the second occasion it would actually stop a negative which is stop the shocks from happening okay so other than getting angry rats with full tummies what did Skinner actually achieve from his experiment? He came up with the concepts of reinforcement and punishment. He derived that behavior will always have consequences and conditioning is derived based on the consequences of your behavior. So one can be conditioned to behave in a certain way based on based on presenting the right type of consequences, okay? Now the consequences of your behavior essentially can be of two types reinforcement and punishment and there can again be two subtypes positive and negative now let's look at these types and subtypes so positive reinforcement implies adding positive incentives to increase responses now for instance let's imagine a child uh, being given a cookie for putting toys back into the toy box now here what we're doing is we're incentivizing the child to put toys back in the box so a positive is added to increase the desired behavior negative reinforcement implies taking something negative away to increase responses for instance the same child is repeatedly told he's doing a bad thing every time he doesn't put the toys back in the box okay and when he starts putting the toys back in the box uh, you stop telling him that he's doing a bad thing so you're essentially removing the negative input and that becomes incentive positive behavior okay positive punishment implies adding a negative to to decrease a behavior in our example this would actually mean punishing the child for not you know by maybe by not letting him watch cartoons to ultimately stop him uh, from leaving a mess with the toys and negative punishment implies removing something to decrease our behavior in our example this would mean getting rid of some of the toys to actually decrease the chances of him making a mess with them now this will slowly result in the child not making a mess with the toys so you're actually removing something to decrease our behavior okay as you can see the outcome achieved is the same in all the cases in our example but the change in behavior is because of the consequences that resulted from the original behavior okay and Skinner observed reinforcement to be a lot more effective than punishment although they both have the same sort of types or subtypes reinforcement is always a lot better than punishment that's because if the parameters of reinforcement are controlled behavior can be conditioned with great accuracy and in terms of reinforcement he suggested that the stimulus be intermittent and not be continuous okay so one can start 
rewarding, for instance, one can start rewarding the mouse after every press of the lever to begin with, which would be called continuous reinforcement. But from that point on, you should actually switch to intermittent reinforcement to reduce the possibility of the subject forgetting the learned response. Now, this is called extinction, okay? So he therefore proposed to work on schedules of reinforcement, which can be as follows. So effectively, what I mean here is that <clears throat> to ensure that the learning derived and the change in behavior is, is long term, the stimulus that you provide, the reinforcement that you provide shouldn't be continuous. You shouldn't incentivize someone all the time. It should be intermittent and that uh, ensures that the, the learning is sustained or it's long term. Okay. Now the types of the schedules of reinforcement are as follows. Fixed ratio. Now you can start rewarding the mouse. Let's say every fifth time it activates the lever. Okay. Variable ratio. Now you can start the reward in this case after every third activation to start with and then after every fix, fifth activation and sh and so on. So the ratio is variable but it's still intermittent, it's not continuous. Fixed intervals. Here you reinforce after specific intervals of time, perhaps after every two minutes, provided the lever is activated at least once. Variable. Now here you decide on the amount of time to begin with say five minutes and then reinforce such that the average of the reinforcements comes to five in the end okay so in principle he proposed that you should you should only start off with continuous reinforcement and then switch to a type that ensures that there is optimal resource utilization in your specific situation in your specific circumstances okay now after all this, you could ask, what, what are the applications? What are the actual ways behaviorism can actually be used? Now, in addition to understanding human psychology, behaviorism can be used in various other ways. Uh, for instance, one of the ways behaviorism can be used is to actually study habit formation. Now, a study conducted by the European Journal of Social Psychology revealed that it can take up to uh, from two to eight months for a behavior to become a habit. So that that is one of the positive findings of behaviorism. Uh, so go on. Think about some of your own habits, be it having a full glass of water when you get up, maybe, maybe flossing after a meal, smoking or anything else, and try and trace it back to when you started it and how long it took before it actually became a habit. Okay, great. So here we looked at uh, some concepts relating to behaviorism and uh, we looked at conditioning and we also looked at some applications. So I hope this was useful for you. I thank you very much for your attendance as always. And as always, keep supporting the content in this channel. Like, subscribe if you're new here. And please take good care of yourself. Thank you very much. Bye bye.